Hi, my name is Angela Zoss. I work as an assessment and data visualization analyst at Duke University Libraries. Duke University sits on land that has long served as the site of meeting and exchange amongst a number of indigenous peoples, historically the Shikori, Catawba, and Eno people. I honor these people today by recognizing that this institution of higher education is built on unceded land. It is also important to recognize that the eight tribes that currently reside in North Carolina. These include the Koheri, Lumbee, Meharan, Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation, Haliwa Saponi, Wakamasuan, Saponi, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee. I honor and respect the diverse indigenous peoples connected to this territory on which I live and work. I honor these people today by recognizing them in order to break the cycle of colonization and the continued erasure of indigenous peoples. As part of this acknowledgement, I am taking time to learn more about the history of the area where I live and work, the role of my institution in the colonization of this area, and the ways that both higher education institutions and disciplines like data visualization and information science create and perpetuate harm to indigenous peoples. I encourage you to join me in exploring ways to support indigenous peoples near your home and workplace and through the work you do. Thank you. One of the most important parts of creating data visualizations is preparing and understanding data. In this lecture, we will focus on cleaning and preparing tabular data so that it can be used by data visualization software. We will also explain different types of data structures you may encounter and how that can affect your experience using software to create data visualizations. Finally, we will cover the responsible use of data, including how different choices you make as you clean and process your data can have large impacts on the design and interpretation of your visualization. Most data visualization tools that can create visualizations with quantitative data require the data to be structured into tables for them to work properly. This includes tools such as Tableau and Excel. Here, we'll cover the ideal structure of a data table for common visualization software. Tabular data, or data that are organized into a table, are the foundation of many data analysis and visualization activities. The classic example of a tabular data set is a spreadsheet. Tabular data includes columns, which are also called fields or variables, and rows, which are also called records or observations. The intersection of a row and column is often called a cell, and inside the cell is a data value that represents the value of that variable for that particular record. For a tabular data set to be used effectively by visualization software, you will often need to make sure it conforms to certain standards. The optimal data format for tabular data includes the following features. All data are in a full table. This means that there are no systemic, systematic gaps like missing rows or columns. There is only data in the data table. There should be no sub subtotals in the middle. Every row should be at the same level. There should be no stats or extra notes at the bottom or sides of the data table. No extra analysis like a sum or average of a particular column. Every column has a header or descriptive label in the first row. There should only be one header per column and there should not be any merged cells in the header row. For machine analysis, like the analysis you'll do to uh, clean and process your data, it can be helpful for column headers to be simple, short and maybe just text with no spaces or unusual punctuation. For the end visualization, however, it can be helpful to have detailed descriptive column headers, or you may have to edit your charts to make sure that the axis labels and legend titles are more human readable than your original column headers. Every column should be as specific as it needs to be for the analysis. So there should be no complex values within a single column, like a list of values or a complex value made up of parts that will need to be analyzed separately. Finally, every value in a column should be consistent. Every value should have the same data type and used a standardized format. This example shows data from a 
carbon dioxide emissions data set. The carbon dioxide emissions are organized by state, economic sector, and year. Here we see that the original data file includes notes that appear below the data table. To format this data for visualization, remove any notes under the data table. If they're still needed, they should be saved elsewhere in supporting documentation. This example data set was also distributed with blanks in the state column. The row with the state name shows the state emissions subtotals for each year. Each row under the state name has a blank in the state column and then specifies the name of an economic sector in the sector column. While someone looking at this data will likely understand that the rows under the state name belong to that state, a computer program won't be able to make that logical leap. Each row needs to have a value for the state column so it knows what state it belongs to. To format the data, make sure that all of the blanks are filled in with the correct state name. The link here leads to an article that describes how to do this kind of operation in Excel. Once the state name is correctly replicated in the rows for each sector, the rows containing the subtotals for each state should be removed. Each record in the data set should be at the same level, in this case, at the level of the economic sector for each state. Data cleaning, also called data wrangling, tidying, or normalizing, is the process of finding and correcting inaccurate or unstandardized data points. With many data visual visualization projects, data cleaning is the bulk of the work. The goal of data cleaning is to make sure the data values are fully machine readable or ready for a computer to analyze or visualize. When preparing your data, clean out any stray punctuation, spaces, test records, spelling errors, and any other issues that impact the data. For text-based data fields, making sure each text value is identical can be important for analysis or aggregation. Extra punctuation or spaces at the end of a value or differences in capitalization can lead to unexpected results. For number-based data fields, any character that is not a number might cause problems for the analysis or visualization. For example, if your software application does not understand percentages formed with the, formatted with the percentage sign, you may need to convert that to a decimal format to be able to complete your analysis or visualization. Similar to removing extraneous punctuation marks or text characters, sometimes the format of the values in a column is inconsistent or inappropriate to a particular type of analysis. The values in a column should be standardized, so they are all formatted the, way, the same way and use a format that works for the software application. For a name column, you might choose to standardize with first name coming before last name, or with last name first followed by a comma and a space and then the first name. For other projects, it might be better to separate first and last name for easier sorting or filtering. For a date column, it is important to make sure that the computer can read the data as a date value. It is also important to make sure the computer knows which part of the date is the month and which is the day, as this can vary depending on the location where data were collected. For most programs, a date format using all numbers and the year, month, day format works well. Finally, it is important to standardize how you represent different types of missing data. You may have to represent multiple types of missing data. For example, a value that is missing because a person skipped a question on a survey versus a value that is missing because that survey question did not apply to that person and was not displayed. Some common ways of representing missing data include blanks, special null data values, the text n slash a to represent not applicable, and the number minus 99. It is important to match your missing data values to your software application and also to the data type of your column. In this example, we have a numerical data column, but there are a few values in the column that will not be recognized as a number. The n slash a text 
is just being seen as a text value, and the same is true for the value with a question mark at the end. While we can see that the value with the question mark at the end looks like a number otherwise, the computer does not know that. It is important to decide how to handle these values before completing an analysis, or the computer may fail when it tries to analyze or visualize this column. Take a look at this data. Does it need additional cleaning? Yes. Right now, a computer application may treat all three of these columns as text columns instead of number columns, which could prevent us from analyzing or visualizing the data. The degree symbols and the word nots inside the cells turn the data from numbers to text unless the particular you, tool you are using understands the degree sign in a special way and still considers those values numbers. Most likely, you will want to remove the extra symbols and text from all three columns. There are many tools, some proprietary and some open source, that can help with, data cleaning, with the data cleaning process. Um, the, the first tool you might use for data cleaning would be spreadsheets, and that could be either using Excel or Google Sheets or the open office version, which is called Calc. Excel itself is proprietary, but there are open versions that exist with many of the same functions. With any spreadsheet, data cleaning is largely manual. Functions and formulas can help automate some of the cleaning work, but the sequence of steps you take will not be documented or reproducible. Another tool called OpenRefine is often used for data cleaning projects. This tool is open source, and the cleaning steps are reproducible. Also, there are a lot of different functions you can use without having to do any coding in this tool. It additionally has advanced features for text cleaning and data reshaping that aren't available in standard spreadsheet software. Another tool you might want to use for data cleaning is Tableau Prep Builder. The cleaning steps in Tableau Prep Builder are reproducible and you can again do a lot without learning any sort of coding. This tool also works well with Tableau, and uh, it can also be used for general data cleaning if you don't use Tableau. This tool, on the other hand, is proprietary. It is not open, so it would require a license. Finally, you might find that using a scripting language is appropriate to your data cleaning needs. Uh, examples of scripting languages that are good for data cleaning include Python and R. These scripting languages are open source. You can create scripts for highly reproducible data cleaning, and what you create will, uh, these scripting languages are very powerful and can allow you to create very complex data cleaning scripts. Because they are scripting languages, however, they can be harder to learn than tools that don't require any coding. Having a data table in the optimal format and with clean data values can represent the majority of the work to prepare data for analysis and visualization, but there is a final step you may have to take. Data tables can actually be arranged into multiple structures. That is, you can make different decisions about what appears in the rows and columns of your data, and those different structures work differently depending on the tool you're using and the kind of visualization you're trying to make. One common data structure is a wide data structure, often called a cross-tab or cross-tabulation. Our CO2 emissions data set was in a cross-tab structure. The hallmark of a cross-tab is that you have a series of columns that all represent some kind of repetition, like creating a separate column for each year of the data set. You could imagine another cross-tab of this data set, where instead of having a separate column for each year, you have a separate column for each state. This would still be considered a wide data structure or a cross-tab. This data structure is good if you want to focus in on the change of the data value across those columns, like the change in emissions over time. In fact, some tools like Excel even prefer a cross-tab for certain kinds of charts, though this seems to be less common over time. Another common data structure is a long data structure, also known as, quote, tidy data or normalized data. In this structure, 
the main numerical data values, or here the CO2 emissions, are combined into a single column. The year is gathered into a column, so it appears as another variable besides state and economic sector. This data structure is often preferred by visualization tools because it is, it is easier to map a single variable to a chart element, for example, mapping the single year column to the x-axis. Creating a tidy data set from a cross tab can be called normalizing the data, transposing the data, or unpivoting the data. Take a look at this example data set. Does it seem like it is tidy enough to do some data visualization? In this case, there is still more tidying to be done. A tidy data set would avoid multiple values in a single column, like the Branson Hall record that has two values under building type. Branson Hall should have two separate records, one for each value of building type. The final thing to consider when you are preparing your data for use in a data visualization is how to visualize that data responsibly. Just as the research question should determine the correct data to collect and use, the data set should drive choices about the visualization. It's important that the, inherit the inherent properties of the data set are matched to the visualization so that the visualization supports the same arguments that are supported by any statistical analysis of the data. The first word of caution when creating a visualization based on your data set is to consider whether your data are really comparable. Sometimes our data include raw values or absolutes, like the total number of unemployed people in a county or the total amount of money donated by alumni from different schools at a university. If we share those data without any context, we may miss important information, like the total number of people in those counties, or the number of alumni who graduated from those different schools, or the average salary of those graduates. A classic and humorous example of visualizing non-comparable absolutes comes from the technology-focused XKCD comic. The comic shows three maps that look almost identical but have wildly different data sets. The caption says, pet peeve number 208, geographic profile maps, which are basically just population maps. This comic challenges the idea that these three disparate data sets are in some way connected just because the maps look similar. Instead, as the comic notes, each map is essentially just showing how populous different areas of the country are. By normalizing these data sets by population, you can look for true spatial patterns, locations where the occurrence of some particular phenomenon is greater or less than you would expect for the size of its population. It's important to be careful when visualizing just part of the data. Sometimes limiting the data supports a false conclusion or one that doesn't hold when viewing the full data set. It's also important to follow best practices for statistical analysis when considering the impact of outliers. Outliers can be inconvenient in visualization, but if you wouldn't remove the outliers from a statistical analysis, it may be distorting the message to remove them from the visualization. Sometimes it makes sense to focus in on parts of the data set, especially if your goal is to explore the patterns specifically within that subset. But even when you are interested in the patterns within the subset, you may need the context of the rest of the data to help clarify or understand the pattern you see. The example above was created to help John Carter, a competitive race car driver, decide whether the driving conditions, specifically cold weather, had an impact on the amount of damage seen to the engine after an engine blowout. Looking at the graph, the pattern between cold weather and damage isn't perfectly clear. Yes, the lowest temperature had the most damage, but the highest temperature also had quite a bit of damage. This chart doesn't really explain what is happening when the engine blows out, and it also doesn't really help John make the decision about whether or not to race in cold weather. Is cold weather really not a factor? What if this was the chart John Carter, John Carter reviewed? In this chart, the races with engine blowouts, which are in red, are contrasted with the races without blowouts in blue. 
When the chart includes only the races with blowouts, we don't have enough context to understand whether there are also races that go well at that temperature. With the full data set, we see that no races below 65 degrees have gone well. With this additional context, racing at temperatures below 65 degrees can be correctly interpreted as much riskier than races at higher temperatures. But these visualizations actually aren't really about racing. In truth, this pair of visualizations was constructed as a case study by business professors Britton and Sitkin in 1990. The, the data points are actually taken from space shuttle launches and were presented when trying to decide whether to launch the Challenger shuttle, which famously and tragically exploded soon after launch because of a weather-related failure of the O-rings. Sometimes focusing just on one part of the data, even if that is the part you are trying to predict and understand, has disastrous consequences. Just like the John Carter example shows, it is often a complicated blend of visualization type, amount of data, and thoughtful division of the data that shows the most important patterns. While it is tempting to think of the full data set as showing the most truthful explanation of the relationship between variables, the Simpsons paradox actually challenges that idea. The Simpsons paradox is a phenomenon that occurs when the full data set shows one relationship between two variables but meaningful subsets of the data set would show the opposite relationship. Imagine, for example, that the graphs above explore the correlation between years of experience and starting salary at a particular place of employment. If you look at the full data set, there seems to be a logical and appropriate positive correlation between experience and salary. In this example, though, Coloring the data points by race shows a hidden pattern in the data that co contradicts the global pattern. Within each race, the correlation between experience and salary is actually negative. With any data visualization project, it is important to let the data themselves drive the visualization. You must explore the data set thoroughly to uncover these hidden patterns before you create a visualization that might, may be misleading. As part of that process of exploring your data, you should also pay close attention to the variation in the data and be careful when undertaking any process of simplification of that variation. There are a variety of ways we might wish to simplify our data for visualization. For example, in time series charts, there may be weekly or seasonal patterns that create noisy data and get in the way of the main patterns. In those cases, it may be appropriate to compute a running average. In maps like the ones shown here, we may want to color regions based on a variable, but the distribution of data in that variable might make it hard to see small changes without additional simplification. The process of simplifying a numerical variable to reduce variation is called binning, and it involves splitting up the data points into different groups. You can split the data up into a large or small number of groups, and the way you split the data up can also vary a lot. In this series of maps, you can see how different strategies for binning the variable that is mapped to color lead to very different maps and potentially very different conclusions about data trends. There may well be multiple valid approaches to binning for a particular variable, but it is important to understand the implications of binning and to make deliberate choices. You should make selections for visual encodings that match the story the data are telling naturally. Preparing data in a way that makes sense to our software allows us to produce very powerful analyses and visualizations, but throughout that process, it is crucial to think about the limitations of our data. Numbers are only placeholders for what is really happening in the world, as is beautifully captured in this quote from Giorgia Lupi. Data represents real life. It is a snapshot of the world in the same way that a picture captures a small moment in time. Numbers are always placeholders for something else, a way to capture a point of view, but sometimes this can get lost. Failing to represent these limitations and nuances and blindly putting numbers in a chart is like reviewing a movie by analyzing the chemical properties of the cellulose on which the images were recorded. As you're learning about and creating data visualizations, please keep these words in mind. 
A chart doesn't make something true. Data doesn't make something true. It bends. It shows many things. So keep your eyes open. This video is part of a series of lectures recorded to teach about basic data visualization concepts. It was designed by members of the Visualizing the Future Symposia project and was made possible in part by a national forum grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. This content is designed to be used freely. See the video description for more information about this lecture series and the Visualizing the Future Symposia project.